Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston. And today on Bewilder Beasts, for this very special edition, we're going to talk about the animals who have been elected as mayors of their town, why donkeys and elephants are used as mascots for the two major American political parties, and a rabbit controversy in the White House. All right, let's go. So I'm going to level with you. I had planned for this to be episode 10, but I felt it's more important to get people out to vote. The 10th episode comes out the day after the 2020 election. So instead, I decided to make this episode 9 to get people excited to vote in six days. If you are a young person, talk to your parents about the importance of voting. Encourage them to go, at the very least, ask them to go get you a sticker at the polls or to submit their ballots by mail. Let them let you see what a ballot looks like. Watch how they fill it out. Talk with them about why voting is important. If you're a person over the age of 18 on November 3rd, 2020, it is important to go out and vote in this election, but not just this election. It is just as important, if not more so, to vote in every other election in your locale. Local government has more to do with your daily life than the federal government as a general rule. And if you don't do your due diligence and vote, other people get to make choices for you. At least if you vote and it doesn't go your way, you had a say. If you don't vote and you don't even try to make your voice heard at the ballot, it's harder to have ground to stand on if you don't like how things turned out. And if you do vote, you might even get to vote for what animal represents you in government. Really. Like our very last story today about animals who are elected mayor of a Vermont town. People voted for animals to run this town, but there's a good reason for it. We are going to do a deep dive today as to why our two political parties use notoriously stubborn animals as their mascots as part of our special Get Out and Vote episode. But first. Jimmy Carter was America's 39th president, and he is a real-life rock star. He is 96 years old and is still building houses for Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity is a nonprofit that builds affordable houses for people who need a place to live. This man is nearly 100 years old and is building houses. He's nailing, he's using hammers, he's drilling, he's physically making houses. And I'm sitting in a closet talking to my sweaters. President Carter also put up solar panels on the White House when he was the commander-in-chief before it was in vogue in the 1970s. They were sadly immediately taken down by his successor, and as far as I can tell, they are still sitting in the White House basement collecting dust. I bring up Jimmy Carter, not for his humanitarian heroism or his environmental efforts, but for the great enraged rabbit incident of 1979. See, most people with a heart and a soul imagine rabbits as just cute, floppy, adorable little critters. Big ears, hopping, twitching nose. But after Jimmy Carter's boat was chased down by a swamp rabbit, not a Pokemon, it turns out, on April 20th, 1979, and the date is relevant as 420 is Earth Day, a day where the press was probably right to assume if Jimmy Carter was the only one who could see Flipper Fuzzy Bottom, as it turns out, people didn't believe rabbits could swim. A book called The Other Side of the Story, written by Jody Powell, Jimmy Carter's press secretary, included the following quote about the rabbit incident. Quote, Upon closer inspection, the animal turned out to be a rabbit. Not one of your cutesy Easter bunny type rabbits, but one of those big splay-footed things that we call swamp rabbits when I was growing up. The animal was clearly in distress or perhaps berserk. The president confessed to having had limited experience with enraged rabbits. He was unable to reach a definite conclusion about its state of mind. What was obvious, however, was that this large, wet animal, making strange hissing noises and gnashing its teeth, was intent on climbing into the president's boat. Apparently, the rabbit was being chased by hunting hounds and it jumped into the river for safety. Can you picture just being in a boat, hanging out, and having a rabbit come tearing after you? Those sharp, pointy teeth? And given Jimmy Carter's boat was chased down by this swamp rabbit four years after Monty Python and the Holy Grail was released in the United States, 
that's the movie with the hilarious killer rabbit scene, it said that the environmentalist president fended off a killer rabbit. I mean, let's be real, I have seen that movie. I'd be worried about letting a berserker bunny into my boat, and I love animals. But unfortunately, like many things poor Jimmy Carter said, environment, humanitarian stuff, killer rabbits, the public, including his own staff, did not believe his story saying rabbits could not swim or that one would never approach a person threateningly. But a White House photographer had taken a photo of the incident, which was released by a later administration. President Carter, ahead of his time on the environment, humanitarianism, and an animal that should be the mascot for 2020, the Berserker Bunny. Why are the elephant and the donkey the symbols of the two big political parties, Democrat and Republican? I am almost 40 years old and I never knew this story. So buckle in. It all goes back to our favorite swearing president, Andrew Jackson, who it turns out was actually the worst for a lot of people. He's the one, if you recall from last week, who taught his parrot how to swear and said parrot had to be evicted from the president's funeral. And I really had no idea that this was going to tie in when I started researching this episode. I swear. Or rather, he swears. And the parrot swears. But I have learned a lot more about Andrew Jackson in the last two weeks than I think I've ever cared to know. Anyway, in 1828, nearly 200 years ago, our soon-to-be seventh president was running for election, and his opponents called him a... Instead of getting offended as intended, as jackass can be an insult, Andrew Jackson leaned in and intentionally used the curse word as his mascot. He put a donkey on all of his pamphlets, posters, letters, everything, and political cartoonists of the time started using it to represent Jackson in newspapers. A picture of a donkey, stubborn, fuzzy, and unmoving. Which, after reading up on him from last week's episode, it's not a big leap to see how they got there. After reading about him for this episode, oh, it's absolutely clear how they got there. So four old, now dead, white dudes were vying for the office of president in 1824. And while Jackson won the popular vote, more people voted for him, and he earned the most of the electoral votes because no candidate got over 50%. The electoral votes, just as a side note, are where the winner of each state gets a number of electoral votes from that state, and the state vote counts decide the winner of the president, not the votes of the people. Weirdly. So when you vote in a presidential election, you're voting for the candidate who gets your state's votes. Anyway, Jackson won the Western states. I hope you can hear those air quotes, Western states, because in 1824, Tennessee was a western state because we hadn't gone that far west yet. There was a clear winner in this election, but since no one got half of the electoral votes, the House of Representatives got to do their own voting, and they decided to make John Quincy Adams the sixth president of the United States, not Andrew Jackson, which infuriated his supporters. They rallied and turned out in the following election in 1828. Jackson won. So remember in the Swearing Parrot episode, Jackson relocated, kicked out Native Americans, essentially securing the deaths of millions of Native people. And I am reading this today on Indigenous People Day. I think it's very important to know our part in this history. He also didn't support the abolitionist movement. It's a real bad look to not support ending slavery in America, no matter what form it takes place in present day. And it turns out this wasn't a very good look at the time, as the abolitionist movement was gaining steam the longer that President Jackson was in charge. It's also prudent to note that Jackson was a slave owner, so he had a vested interest in keeping slavery. Many of the things that Jackson stood for, or didn't stand for, or stood on the wrong side of history on, nearly got assassinated for, he was the first president to have an assassination attempt on his life, 
But Davy Crockett helped save the assassin from Jackson, as the 67-year-old Jackson, known as Old Hickory, was beating the assassin up to a pulp with his Old Hickory cane. Yes, that Davy Crockett. These ideals are still very much woven into the fabric of America today. We are still protesting and yelling about this, and we are still dealing with all of this today. And I had no idea about any of this before starting a silly podcast about animals targeted for kids. So it's crazy to see what you find out when you dig. 40 years after Jackson's election, a few decades after his parrot swore a blue streak at his funeral, what does any of this have to do with animals? Well, a cartoonist named Thomas Nast in 1870s really solidified the use of the elephant and the donkey as political icons. And if you don't think you know who Thomas Nast is, you do. His picture on Wikipedia looks like he was the model for the entire cast of Wyatt Earp. Kids, ask your parents. The Santa Claus that you know and love, jolly old Saint Nick, belly like a bowl full of jelly, red cheeks, the whole shebang. Yeah, that's all Nast. Nast is also responsible for popularizing, though not creating, the famous images of Uncle Sam. He was considered to be the father of the American cartoon. So I guess in a way you can thank him for Disney Plus, Pixar, and for people my age, Saturday morning cartoons and Sunday funnies. So while he didn't create the donkey and the elephant, he was inspired as many political cartoonists use ideas from previously drawn art. And with his art, there is little question that he was the one to solidify them as icons in these two dominant parties. And while the parties essentially switched sides on social issues, the names remained and the mascots, the donkey and the elephant, have remained staples. The Republicans, also called the GOP for Grand Old Party, officially adopted the elephant as their mascot, but the Democrats, even though they have been associated with the donkey for much longer, even before the GOP was founded, hasn't officially adopted the donkey. Why not? Well, I mean, they are messy and expensive to keep. Kidding. See, in the 1860s, Republicans used to be more prevalent in the northern states. They wanted more power at the federal level, laws that worked for the whole country, not just individual states. Republicans used to push for public and expanding transportation like railroads, founding state university systems, and granting protections for African Americans. The Republicans of old were fierce supporters of social justice, freeing slaves, etc. When Democrats opposed all of these measures, they wanted states to be responsible for ruling the people, advocating for keeping slaves. But the Wild West, the Wild Wild West was up for grabs and land for votes. It was then that the Republican Party decided to get their votes. They needed to support smaller government and weirdly start supporting the cessation of social progress to focus on business. The Democrats of yore needed the votes but realized farmers moving west from the north also needed a voice. So instead of supporting big businesses as they had before, they decided to support issues of a social nature, progressive issues, and started seeing big businesses as the problem that the Republicans thought just a few years before. But if they switch sides on most every single social issue, but all the supporters basically stayed put, how can that be? It comes down to business. The core of both parties stayed the same on this one issue, and it's the same issue that's still a defining issue in both parties. Republicans want and have always wanted bigger businesses. Early on, bigger businesses need a bigger government to support their foundations, their existence. But now they prefer a more hands-off system because money, trade, and systems were put in place already to protect those larger businesses. And even today, those businesses by design don't fail the same way a giant yacht can hit a small bump in the water that would tip over a small dinghy. They are a foothold of the American fabric, and they benefit from that foundation while asking for hands off. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party started asking for smaller government, hands off, but they could never get started, and their social issues were deeply problematic. I mean, being for slavery? Really, guys? But they realized that government had an obligation to help those in need, not big businesses, and without people, we don't have a business. So if you go back far enough, you will see Democrats and Republicans weirdly on different sides of women's rights, education, taxation, transportation, slavery, nearly every single issue except 
business. When the Republican Party was founded, from the failed fractured parties that broke up and rejoined as the Republican Party included the Whig Party, the Know Nothing Party, okay, who was on their naming and PR team, and the abolitionist get rid of slavery for God's sakes groups. They discussed using an elephant in part due to a common phrase at the time. Seeing the elephant was a phrase that soldiers entering battle would say. Why? I have no idea. Maybe they were also chasing the dragon. But Nast, a Republican himself, knew the power images could have. And by having standing characters in his cartoons, it would be easier to get his point across. Mascots have lasting power. Obviously, we are still using the donkey and the elephant 150 years later. Thomas Nast had used these animals to support or lampoon, make fun of, or downright criticize policies and politics on both sides. And his art was a long way from what Andrew Jackson had in the early 1800s. You all have to look this up. I saw an image of the first political cartoon with Andrew Jackson as a literal jackass, a pretty detailed donkey kicking. But instead of a donkey's face, it has what looks like someone took a realistic sticker of Andrew Jackson's face and just popped it on the donkey at a wonky angle. Now cartoons, even of animals, can have qualities of people, but I guess they were still workshopping that until Nast came along. But it was really Nast who perfected and solidified these characters for better, for worse, for America. So maybe Nast was on to something. A stubborn jackass and a giant elephant in the room about business's role in American society seems pretty on the nose, pretty ahead of his time for a guy in 1860. Third-party candidates have had a long history of making elections way more colorful. In one Vermont town, the third-party candidate was Murphy, a cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Yep, a dog. But this dog has a different perspective than the incumbent or sitting mayor, who was a Nubian goat named Lincoln at the time. The third candidate was a police canine. The dog, not the handler. You see, the town of Fairhaven, Vermont has a town manager, yes, a human, who can cut ribbons, sign paperwork, run the town, all the things you need thumbs for in a lot of cases. But since 2019, the position of mayor is a decorative position, one that's just intended to get the attention and raise money necessary for another goal. In this case, people can enter their pets into an election for a $5 fee. The animals then do fundraising, in this case to help build a new playground in the town for the kids. Residents can also donate on election day at the polls to help make sure the playground becomes a reality. Lincoln the Goat has retired and is said to have moved away from politics after losing his mayoral seat to Murphy the Dog. He can now be seen eating whatever it is that goats eat and trying his hand, hoof, at goat yoga. And before I sign off, if you are old enough to vote, please vote. And if there's an animal on your ballot, let me know by emailing bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet me at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeasts on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. And if you are not old enough to vote, tell an adult that it is important that they vote for you your friends, the environment, for all these animals that we talk about on this show, and those whose voices aren't heard. If someone says their voice doesn't matter, it does. And if they don't think their voice needs to be heard, tell them instead they can speak up for someone who can't. And that's pretty powerful. So use your voice to vote or encourage your grown-ups to vote. It's really, really important. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go vote and go get curious. I got today's information from Live Science, Mental Floss, Wisconsin Public Radio, Dictionary.com, History.com, 
edition.cnn.com on the Goat Dog Honorary Mayoral Election in Vermont, Facebook.com, the Fairhaven Police Department's Facebook page, with an adorable photo of Murphy announcing his candidacy for mayor of Fairhaven, Vermont, Wikipedia on Jimmy Carter's rabbit incident, and the Burlington Free Press. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. All those things other podcasts tell you to do, and go vote. Thank you for listening.